Uh, we mentioned last time that maybe the first thing you should do when you're taking your exam is to write down this lens mirror chart. And maybe something else you should do besides writing down the lens mirror chart is write down that chart from the bottom of page one that categorizes all the different types of diverging and converging lenses. Because if you take your time, you'll be able to get those correct, and then you won't have to keep figuring them out over and over again during the test. But anyway, that's something you need to drill on ahead of time before the test. It's important to be able to quickly look at any lens or mirror and decide if it's diverging or converging so we know the focal length. Okay. Now, why, why am I making such a big book to do about this? Well, how would we actually use this whole process to solve a problem? Well, probably the next step now would be to use our lens mirror equation to solve for one of our variables. And the way we would do that is we would plug in for f. We have to plug in for f so that we can find other i or o here. Do you something? Ah, there we go. We won't actually do the calculations here because um, I didn't tell you about variables. But if I was going to use this lens mirror equation, what number should I plug in for f? Um, negative one half. That's right. Where, but most students would plug in one half, and then they would have lost the battle right there. If we plug in the wrong sign, we're going to get the wrong answer. Uh, we might as well actually. It's probably going to be easiest here if we rewrite this as negative 0.5. So we can say the focal length is negative 0.5. But the key thing is, hopefully, we now have the habit that we would never just write down 0.5 in our lens mirror equation. We've got to put a sign in front of it. And the sign here would be negative. OK. So again, as usual, we have to get in the habit of putting signs in front of our uh, distances. Uh, this is one of the, the, the most popular traps uh, in this area of physics. Uh, because the instructors know that people tend to assume this formula um, also gives them the sign. Uh, but it doesn't. It only gives us the magnitude. So we've got to put these big fat dots in here to remind, remind ourselves that this is only giving magnitudes. It's our job to figure out the sign. Okay. Let's say that r equals uh, half a centimeter. Let's figure out f for this mirror. So your answer would be f equals negative 0.25 centimeters. OK, now let's check both the magnitude and the sign. This is the equation that gives us the magnitude. Um, and maybe the first thing we can do is instead of plugging in 1 half, we might as well just plug in 0.5 for r. I'm going to keep putting in this fat dot here to remind myself that the formula is only going to give me the magnitude. So doing a little algebra, we can see that f is 0.5 divided by 2. Well, 0.5 divided by 2 is 0.25, but that's just the magnitude. OK, so it looks like we got the magnitude correct. Uh, now describe to me, how did you get this sign? Oops, let me, uh, I'm going to, i got to redo this sign here. The sign is actually going to be positive because it's a converging mirror. Because the light would be coming in from the right. Correct. And when it bounces off, the two rays would be converging towards each other. And we know converging means a positive sign. Mm -hmm. All right, and we've talked about how we will always put a positive sign in front of positive numbers to force ourselves to think about the sign. Uh, so what was the trap here? Well, the trap is that I kind of put the back side of the mirror on the opposite edge that it was in the handout. So that would be a perfectly fair trap on the test. They could do anything. They could draw the mirror like this. So it doesn't have to look exactly like the handout. So we have to take our time uh, and carefully ask uh, what type of mirror it is. Uh, if you really wanted to go step by step and use the handout here, you might say, well, if somebody was looking into this mirror, they wouldn't look into it from here. Remember, these little slashes mean the backside. They would look into it from here, but it looks like they're looking into a cave. So we know this is concave. And then if you look at the handout, you can see a concave mirror is converging. 
and converging means positive. So it's very important to just go step by step because there's lots of little traps here. So what number should I plug in for f over here? Uh, positive 0.25. Yeah, even though it's positive, we should plug in the positive sign just so we're always thinking about that sign. All right, and then hopefully if we do another variable, we can figure out the third. Okay, well, I won't uh, give you any more uh, drill on that, but that's something you can see that uh, it's important for you to drill on on your, on your own, using that table at the bottom to make sure you can tell whether the signs are positive or negative. That's one of the biggest uh, obstacles to getting problems right here. Okay, uh, so that's definitely doable with practice. Okay, so uh, we learned about this formula. Let's take a look at the handout. So this is a new equation. Uh, if you look at the equations on page two, this is this equation here. I used capital R in the handout. Unfortunately, my... Uh, printer only puts in the very small dot, but those dots here are to show that this is for magnitudes. The magnitude of R equals 2 times the magnitude of F, and this is for mirrors only. There is an equation. Curved or plane mirrors? Ah, that's a good question. Okay. Um, remind me to get back to that in one minute. Okay. All right. Uh, but the answer is yes, curved or plane mirrors. Now, this is the equation I mentioned for lenses, mm -hmm. but uh, you might not need that. We'll see that. You haven't seen that in class? Yeah. Okay, so you might just cross that out. You'll only need the mirror equation. Over here, yeah. Some textbooks. Uh, Oh, just forget about that. Okay, now, <laughs> based on this equation, uh, remind me, what does R measure directly? Is it a measure of curvature or flatness? Uh, flatness. Yeah, despite the name, a big R really means something that's very flat. So now we can figure out what does F stand for, curvature or flatness. Is a, if you have a big F, would that mean you had a very flat device or a very curved device? You might need to work that out on paper. That's a good thought set. Good. So we should write that down. And how does that help us? Does that mean that a big F means something that's very flat or very curved? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's going to be a big F is going to be something that's very flat. Okay. Good. This is the type of question that I uh, ask almost all of my students for every type of equation. Um, what, what, how does, what's the relationship between variables? And then I always say something like, work that out on paper. Um, but actually, I guess, maybe uh, what I think of as working out on paper is not what everyone else thinks of, because no one ever actually quite works that out on paper, quite how I have in mind. So here, here's what I mean by that. Uh, we want to know, what does it mean when f is big? Well, if we could just figure out the relationship between f and r, we would be in good shape. So here's what I mean by thinking on paper. I'm going to write the word big over here under the f. Now, based on this equation, if f is big on the right-hand side of the equation, does that mean r has to be big or small on the left-hand side of the equation? It has to be big. So now I'm actually going to write down the word big. That is what I mean by thinking on paper. I mean just writing down these words to think through the thought steps here. This equation, so does this equation tell us that f and r are directly related or inversely related? Directly related. Direct, directly related. So now I'm going to continue thinking on paper. When f is big, I know that that means r is big. And we've already figured out previously, when r is big, is that something curved or flat? Flat. But now, I've finished my thinking on paper, and I've seen that a big F indicates something that's very flat. OK. Uh, a big F indicates something very flat. So this is probably still a technique that we'll end up using uh, a bunch more times the rest of this quarter. So this is what I mean when I'm talking about thinking on paper, <laughs> about figuring out the relationship between variables, just writing down the thought steps with arrows like this, and asking when one thing is big, does that make the other thing big or small in the equation? And even though this is pretty straightforward, people can still get confused about this if they do it in their heads. It's much better to write the words down on paper for working it out. Uh, it really is important to have this basic intuition for what the variables mean, uh, because without that, we, we just make lots of mistakes when we try to just plug and chug into the formulas. It's important to have this basic intuition for what the variables stand for. Anyway, the upshot here is that a big F measures something flat. We might think that F is for flat. As a memory aid, we might think that F stands for flat. Uh, so F and R basically measure the same thing. They're both measuring flatness. 
Uh, now, of course, if you know how flat something is, you kind of know how curved it is as well. But the point is that f is directly related to the flatness. A big f means something that's very flat. So you might think that r and f are almost different ways of measuring the same things. They're both ways of measuring uh, flatness. 